it's a competition clinching shot. Whoa, how about that? The LET Golf Podcast, the official podcast of the Ladies European Tour. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the LET Golf Podcast, the exclusive podcast from the Ladies European Tour, where we take you inside the ropes to chat to the stars of the show. I'm George Cooper and with me as always is media official Nicola Kenton. Nicola, what a week it's been on tour. Yeah, a great week. We've just come off of, obviously, first three weeks of the season, now complete. Yeah, it was brilliant. So we had the Aramco Saudi Ladies International and once again it delivered, didn't it? Yeah, we, we're starting well on the LET this year. Lots of competition, lots of big names coming up and yeah, great start. On the Aramco Saudi Ladies International, obviously the tour's been to Royal Greens a lot over the past few years. And plenty of big names in attendance last week and it was one of the biggest names who came out on top. Yeah, it certainly was. I mean, it was it was billed as a star-studded field and, th- and they all showed up really. We had Lydia Ko taking the victory again, her second victory after winning in 2021. But it didn't tell the whole story really. I mean, we had, a, we had an absolute showdown on the final day. I mean, in amongst the stars, which of course you had Lexi Thompson, Lydia Ko, uh, Emily Pedersen, who's won before, Georgia Hall was up there. But we also had a DT Ashok again, absolutely flying the season. She won in Kenya, she was third place in Morocco, and then she went toe to toe with the world number one Lydia Ko, fought her all the way, ended up losing by one. Um, and of course, we had Manon de Roy, absolutely brilliant performance on the weekend. She equaled the course record on Sunday with a 63, having seen the course record equal the day before by Lexi Thompson. So it was just absolutely brilliant golf. And yeah, like I say, we had we had stars performing as you'd expect and we had some some LE, really good LET performances as well, didn't we? Yeah, as you say, to see Aditi's form continue this season, um she she'll just want the season to keep going. I know she's gone home for a few weeks now, but <laughs> I'm sure she would have just wanted to keep playing, honestly. Uh as you say, the fact that she did more pars under round again and again and went toe to toe in those final two groups on the final day, just missing out, um, but winning the biggest paycheck of her career thus far. And as you say, Manon equaling that 63, becoming the fifth player to do that around Royal Greens. Um, And just obviously we watched her on 18 where she had an eagle putt, which would have been a 62 if that had gone in. Um, She said afterwards that her hands were shaking. She was the most nervous that she's ever been, uh, unsurprisingly. But yeah, to see her do that, have such a good start to the season after obviously finishing fourth on the race to Costa del Sol last year. Um, She just picked up right where she's left off and is heading straight forward in 2023. Yeah, it's great to see. And yeah, it really sets up the season um, very well. Three events, they've all delivered. And yeah, I just can't wait, can't wait for more events. Um, so yeah, but the thing is, if that wasn't enough, um, because the golf was absolutely brilliant, wasn't it? We've also had a very special Solheim Cup announcement today, which I guess leads us nicely onto our guest for this week. Nicola, what is the big news? Yeah, so obviously it's an off week on the LET, but that does not mean that the news stops. We made an announcement that Solheim Cup captain for Europe, Suzanne Pettersson, obviously she'll be there in Spain in September. She has decided to continue her Solheim Cup journey and will also be captain next year for the 2024 Solheim Cup, which will be played at Robert Trent Jones Golf Club in uh, the States. And as last week, Stacey Lewis also made the announcement that she is continuing. So she will also be the Team US captain for 23 and 24. So we'll have both captains going toe to toe on back to back years in the Solheim Cup. And as you say, we spoke to Suzanne Let's get her thoughts on being back-to-back captain for Team Europe. Hello, Suzanne. Welcome to the LET podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're joining us today as we've made an announcement. I want to say congratulations for being named the Team Europe captain for the 2024 Solheim Cup. First off, how proud are you to be named back-to-back captain for Team Europe? Well, obviously, it's a little different. I kind of, uh, you kind of become, you can, you get the second time around even before the first one's played. Um, but it was kind of a part of the deal for the from the European tour side, uh, especially because it's such a quick turnaround. Uh, had it been more of a normal procedure where you probably had a, a two year in between, uh, probably looked different, but. 
because of how it's all placed out on the schedule, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and especially now that I've uh, been part of this captaincy role for quite a bit, I understand why. Uh, and also kind of for the for how the all the decisions uh, already been made. I mean, already we've kind of looked at stuff for 24, so it's kind of overlapping as well. So I think it makes perfectly sense. And uh, I mean, I love this. Uh, it's a, I mean, so far it's just been pure joy and obviously it's a great honor. Uh, I don't, I think it will feel different once I get to Spain and kind of the players starts arriving and, and all of this, I kind of feel the adrenaline a little bit different, but uh, to be able to go Europe and to go back to the US um, will probably be quite different. Um, so I'm glad I can kind of uh, maybe start uh, kind of a, a strategy or a philosophy for the team to kind of have the um, continue uh, the continuous uh, kind of um, um, philosophy going, um, I would say. And why is representing Team Europe and being part of Team Europe so special for you? It helped me define me as a player, um, kind of just to be thrown out there to kind of to the sharks and kind of uh, it's like a survival in a thing uh, as a rookie. Uh, you just have to learn to kind of find your way or what works and how what doesn't work. Uh, you go through emotions, adrenaline, um, anxiety, uh, uh, everything in the emotional specter. They just have to learn how to deal with um and i think with experience you kind of you find your way but at the same time um uh, if i'd look back at my career uh and not have have had all the solheim cup uh, memories experiences and everything that comes with it um a huge part would have been missing uh, i would say i mean it's it's really probably been uh the highest high but i've also had some um some some lows um but at the same time um uh, being a part of a winning team or a losing team um if you take kind of the the winning aspect out of it there's so much more you sit back with uh in the aftermath and um i mean you have you you, you bond for life with the with players uh you have memories for lives and uh it's like when you share uh a, um, a journey together it, it, it all comes different and uh, as an individual athlete um, I'll, well uh, 12 months out of the year normally it, it kind of means differently and I think what's also fun is all the Europeans were very laid back uh, to start we kind of bought, I mean for us to team up is always just uh, joy and excitement and it's never hard to kind of uh, get the team together um, yeah, Solheim is the pinnacle of our, our women's sport. Of that, yeah. You touched on it there about sort of some of your memories of the Solheim Cup. I think we should start probably with your debut in 2002. But just sort of talk to me about coming in then as a fresh rookie. You always strike me as someone that never gets nervous, but, you know, how was it coming in in 2002? And, and talk us through that experience. Well, I don't think you really know what to expect. Right. And everything was overwhelmed. I mean, I was overwhelmed by like all the stuff in the room, like the reception, like being a part of the team. I was driving in the same uh, that in 2002, we kind of had cars, not only buses. I mean, I was sitting in this. Uh, we had this American sedan car and it was like three seats in the front and I was jacked in the middle and Laura Davis was driving. I mean, this was all new to me uh, and I was playing with. Um, superstars that I'd looked up to, uh, role models, icons of the game. And I was kind of, I was fortunate enough to be a part of it and kind of be, play alongside them on the same team. It was amazing. And I think already then, I mean, I just loved it. Uh, obviously you realize uh, 10 times bigger crowds, more pressure, everything's on the line. Um, and obviously had the famous f-bomb drop live on american tv so that kind of probably what i most famous for from 2002 uh my comeback against uh, michelle redmond uh, at the time it looked like a crucial point half point whatever uh, but at the end we lost it so um but i mean uh, i think it kind of helps you um uh, grow as a person as well uh, to just be thrown into situations like that and 
uh, obviously, have you been part of one? You want to be part of all of them uh, moving forward. Yeah, definitely. And then obviously, you come back a year later, you go undefeated. Um, how special was that? And sort of what are your memories from that, from that edition of the Solheim Cup? Well, that was in Sweden. So obviously, Anna being at the probably pinnacle of her career, it was uh, even bigger crowds. I remember, I remember all of it as it was the today. Uh, and I remember uh, the first pairing. I was paired with Annika, and I mean, I still felt like a rookie. I kind of had massively respect for Annika, and I didn't feel as comfortable around. I didn't kind of know her that well at the time, and. I remember when uh, they gave us the pairings and they said um, Annika, Sornstam and Susanna. I'm like, am I pairing? I'm, I'm paired with Annika. And I remember I had to call my mental coach. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm so nervous. Like, how am I going to deal with this? And then I remember they reversed and they said, why do you think you're paired with it? Maybe she asked to play with you. I'm like, do you think she asked to play with me? I'm like, what? Uh, would that ever happen? And but it kind of it kind of brought around my mindset and said maybe that was the occasion. Um, uh, and uh, I remember we woke up on that Friday morning and that um, famous fog came rolling in over Barca Beck and the first tee shot got delayed. Uh, no, we actually got to hit the first tee shot and Anka hit it straight into the woods on the left. And um, the play was suspended, so we all went back into the clubhouse. I went straight to the range. I had my caddy pacing off um, um, the yardage, the shot I was I needed to play out of the woods. So I was just standing there, and he walked out. He paced out whatever it was, 100 and I don't know what the actual yards say. It was 178 yards. I did it under the tree, rolling up into the green. And he, I couldn't hardly see him because it was just so foggy. And I stood there until he just shouted, you got it. And then we finally went back out on the course. Uh, I grabbed my club that I've been practicing on the range, hit it out of the woods. I hit it to about two feet, and she knocked in the birdie. And um, that was a roller coaster of a journey that I had with Annika. Uh, and I think we went undefeated from then on. Uh, all the songs we played. So, I mean, 2003. I mean, each Solheim has its kind of uh, history and its kind of uh, place in my heart. Um, so. That was a lot of fun, and I obviously we won early on the Sunday. And I remember Katrina Nilsmark, the captain, she had a ruptured disc because she was just sitting on this uh, lappe chair. I don't know how you call it in English on the uh, on the on the buggy. She couldn't even stand up, and so that kind of gave us extra inspiration as well to kind of uh, make her proud and um, have some fantastic memories as well from Saturday afternoon uh, four ball with Annika. Uh, we won on the 18 and. If I look at kind of the the pictures from it, it looks like a fairy tale, like with the, the, in the sunset and the me jumping into or Annika jumping into my arms and uh, no, it was it was so much fun. But what I took most from 2003 it was like I really got to know Annika a lot better. I mean, she had always been a massive role model for me coming from Norway. She was Swedish. She kind of proved to the world that you could be the best in the world, even though coming from Sweden, uh, not maybe the biggest golf uh, destination in the world. Um, and I kind of not only got to know her, but I kind of got to know her while playing. So I got to kind of be inside her head. I got to know how she was thinking. I mean, her kind of uh, mentality. I mean, so much you really can't read in a book. And I got a like front row seat uh, and I took it all in. I tried to use as much uh, that I could for the remaining part of my career. Yeah, absolutely. And I imagine you got some pretty wild celebration stories from after that Sunday, right? Those I don't remember as well. <laughs> absolutely. That's the right answer right there. So sort of jumping forward then, um, what other sort of memories do you have from the Solheim Cup? Um, you go from there, then all the way to 2019, of course, um, where you come in as a captain's pick. Just talk us through that and talk us through some other memories you have from the tournament. Oh, I mean, I've had a lot. I mean, I remember... Ireland in 2011 was another mm. fantastic one. Uh, um, Ali was captain, I was Nicholas, and uh, I remember it was like, I remember, I, I think I was maybe the best ranked European player, but um, there was a question if I had to play one more event to kind of qualify directly, or she had to kind of pick me because I kind of hadn't done my share. And we had kind of this uh, dispute, um, Ali and I, and, I ended up going to Ireland just to kind of, I guess I took one for the team. I took uh, played one extra LT so she didn't have to waste the, the wild card on me. And 
Um, it had just ended up being a fantastic week uh, a couple of weeks after. Um, and uh, the Sunday there was uh, another magical moment. I remember it was so bad weather in Ireland on that Sunday that I remember Beanie had already kind of uh, won her first match before kind of the last match had even started because it was so much uh, start, stop, start, stop. And um, there was a fantastic little uh, pep talk chat um, um, head wall. Asahara and myself had on the on the golf car, golf buggy uh, going out to the course to kind of finish off the, our last five holes and we kind of we all had to win our our matches and uh, we all did and um, some uh, yeah I mean um, you kind of get goosebumps just thinking about it but it's just moments like that is you just don't capture it on your own in the individual career um, and that's kind of what I've loved about Solheim uh, and it's always always brought out it's amazing how Solheim just always brings out the best everyone's best game uh, everyone puts uh, out of their shoes uh, people hole shots people just I mean it's amazing kind of the atmosphere that you just you want to bring your a game and for the most part everyone does so it's always a very high level being played and uh, at, at the end of the day, it's just one part here or there that kind of goes uh, either way. That kind of makes a difference, really. So 11 was great. 15 was a was a lot of fun. We sh probably should have had the biggest defeat in the history of women's Solheim. And it turned out to be a disastrous uh, situation, especially in the aftermath. Uh, so that kind of uh, gave me a little different taste. Uh, that's the first time golf has kind of really kind of erupted my heart uh, to the point where I literally gave it a thought if I should ever play golf again, uh, just the aftermath of everything that kind of uh, happened and um, especially how that was the first time I really felt the the backside of the metal of the social media, um, how tough that uh, kind of side can be. I mean, when everything rolls great and everything's your way, everything is happy-go-lucky, social media is great. But there was a backside of that that I kind of really uh, faced and it hit me really hard. It hit me a lot harder than I thought. Um, uh, so that was obviously tough. And then uh, you obviously overcome it uh, with time. Um, but then 2017 came around, Annika was captain. Um, uh, unfortunately, my, my back went out the weekend before. So I made it, uh, I promised Annika I should do anything in my power to kind of uh, get myself playable, but I never made it. So I remember swapping kind of position with Beanie, who was kind of our first sub uh, being on side, and she was kind of a vice captain of to Annika at the time. So uh, I remember when Annika came to me and said, uh, would you just rather be a vice captain alongside me and Beanie taking your spot? I said, oh, you know what? I it would be my biggest honor to kind of give Beanie this spot because I will not be able to play my best. I don't think I can even hit a golf shot. So that was kind of an easy decision and kind of my first kind of more inside uh, part being more part of the captaincy team, um, a little bit more um, involved with discussions, even though Annika kind of had the final say, I kind of, uh, it was more like, listening and learning a little bit and obviously giving some advice um, of what you thought. Um, but that was kind of my first um, taste of the captaincy role, uh, how that could possibly play out. And um, then obviously I had a child in 18 and uh, I kept being bugged by certain players that I had to kind of get back because they, I was needed on the team in 19. and. Uh, for a while, it was quite foreign for me that I was going to be able to make it, but um, I guess we're so stubborn. So once you kind of set yourself to go to kind of come back, I did everything in my power and then um, the rest is history from 19. But uh, that was also a fun journey to kind of the process of getting back uh, into com well, competitive mode. Um, um, that was, uh, I mean, it's not like not necessarily like biking. You still have to really put in the work and the hours. So um, 
so obviously when 2019 kind of had the way it all turned out it was almost a massive release for me uh i remember when that part went in uh, yeah i mean we won but for me it was more like a thousand kilos dropped off my shoulders because obviously it felt being a captain's pick for the first time in my history um uh, uh you obviously feel the pressure um you definitely don't want to uh, disappoint anyone um and uh, I'm glad it turned out the way it did. Being the vice captain to Beanie um, in Toledo, that was just, uh, I just remember standing on that first day being very happy I didn't have to hit one shot. <laughs> and it was fun to be part of, uh, take part of kind of Beanie's uh, way of uh, uh, leading the team. Uh, I think she was brilliant. And obviously having played, uh, I've played nine, I've been a part of 10, but Every captain is different and they do kind of bring this their own flavor to it. And that's kind of what I take going into this uh, role, kind of uh, I take the best from all the captains I've played under, um, which is a lot. And then literally try to put kind of my flavor to it. I was going to say, obviously, speaking of Beanie and Annika, what did you learn from them in how they conducted themselves with the team? and what they did during the weeks that you're going to take forward with you? Well, Annika and Bini, very different in particular. Very, like, uh, if I start with Annika, Annika was also during her, uh, as a player, she is uh, very, uh, she was very dedicated. She was very kind of, uh, she was always kind of, like she was into stats she was like she was very prepared she kind of knew four days in advance what uh what clothes she was going to wear three weeks out like she was like um i don't know how you can explain it very intense in one way but at the same time very kind of uh, competitive i mean when annika walks into the room uh people listen right uh it's just kind of uh part of her aura that kind of uh, comes with her. So that was different. But um, if I compared that to Beanie, Beanie a lot more laid back, um, maybe felt a bit more approachable um, in a way uh, for players. Not like Annika wasn't approachable, but uh, Beanie was just being herself. And Beanie being herself is not stressful. Like you hardly find Beanie being nervous, you know, it never shows. Uh, and that really translated, I think, into the players. Um, and uh, she was well prepared. I know that because I obviously you know all the work she did in advance. And that all the preparation obviously give you a lot of confidence uh, for the week of. Uh, it's like going up to exam. If you haven't done your work, you'll probably not feel as good sitting there with the paperwork in front of you. Well, if you've kind of done your part, uh, you kind of can't wait to get started. Uh, so it's kind of the same way. Um, I really felt uh, Beanie was a really good captain. Obviously, it's easy to remember the last one's the best, but uh, she's definitely, she was definitely, of all the captains I've uh, been part of, she was maybe my favorite. And has she given you any words of wisdom heading into 23? Of course. Of course. <laughs> are, you, are you happy to, to disclose any of those? Uh, well, I mean, uh, the first thing I thought, uh, I don't understand why you won't go for a three-peat. Uh, she said, you can take that because you're you're much tougher than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I mean, she's obviously been, um, she was obviously captain twice, and then she was a vice captain uh, a few times before that. I mean, so she's kind of done it all, uh, quite a lot. So the, my first kind of thought that crossed my mind is like I wanted her to be part of the team one way or the other. Uh, so she was the first one I reached out to kind of discuss uh, certain things. I had a sit down dinner with her, talk through, just kind of rule her in or out. Um, she'll always be supportive. Uh, she's only a phone, uh, phone call away from me um, for questions or advice or things that might be up for discussions. And I know that. Um, so, and that is kind of nice because it's, I guess golf is a big sport, but the world of golf is not that big, especially women's golf in Europe is even smaller. So I feel like the connections uh, between everyone is 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 just a, you're only a phone call away to kind of get help or advice. Uh, I mean, uh, I was in Portugal two weeks ago and <laughs> there was uh, I mean, it was this uh, pro am celebrity thing and uh, you had. Uh, 
one, two, three, I think we had four or five past European Solar Cup captains there. So just there I had a brilliant time to just, uh, if I had any questions, it was a perfect uh, opportunity to kind of, uh, kind of, yeah, lay the land. And uh, I also used that situation to kind of uh, uh, dig into Jose Ulasabal's head and Langer and Montgomery. I mean, we all we all want to succeed and we all wish uh, each other well. So um, I've, I've been finding that everyone's very helpful and very um, open minded and sharing kind of what was their secret and what was kind of their kind of what they thought was important uh, to do well. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to take in as much um, advice as I can and kind of then sort it out uh, separately to what's going to work for this team. Uh, this team is going to be younger, um, probably the, one of the youngest team we've ever had, um, and maybe we'll have the most rookies we've ever had. Um, and it looks like on paper that we're going to start have uh, a lot more Swedes on the team. Uh, when I first started, uh, usually half the team was Swedes. Uh, they usually took up six out of twelve spots uh, every year, and uh, um, in a couple of years' time, we might uh, be there again. Uh, so, I mean, time changes and uh, players come, play, new players kind of uh, arise to the occasion and uh, uh, it will be an interesting one this year. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's been a while now, actually, since you were initially named as captain. So I've sort of got to ask, like, what have you been working on in that time um, and how, how's the process going? I mean, I think it's, I think it's going really well. <laughs> um, no, so obviously the work that I've done with the LET, they kind of make my life and job a lot easier. But you still have to be involved with a lot of decision. Um, and it's amazing how much say you actually have as a captain. Uh, I never realized that. Uh, not that I'm ever going to use that uh, overly too much. But uh, and I also kind of involved the, the vice captains um, uh, along the way quite for a while now. And we kind of we meet regularly um, and we kind of have our updates. Um, um, so, I mean, I think uh, as of now, I feel we are all very prepared. I mean, it, now it's literally more up to the players, how the team is going to shape up and who's going to... And it's still a long way to go, even though it's uh, getting closer and closer in the calendar. But there's still a lot of golf to be played before the team's going to be announced. And it's going to be fun to see kind of who races, uh, who's going to rise to the occasion, kind of who really wants to kind of put their name on the list of who really wants to make it. I mean, we have four captain's picks, so uh, I am i don't have any kind of set uh, names that I kind of intend to, to bring. I mean, uh, everyone's going to be able to play their way into the team uh, if they want to. So the deadline is, um, it is, what it is when it is. And before that, um, people, players have to use uh, the tournaments uh, wisely and kind of... Uh, show me that they really want to be part of this because i only i want hungry players i want players playing well um, and i want to bring energy um so uh, yeah so i guess it's sort of important to have like a a good mix of personalities in there right you're always going to end up having a mixture of personalities um and i think what's my most important job is trying to facilitate for the team uh to have the the week of their life uh, it's a lot easier being a player. You just show up and you play golf. I mean, that's kind of, you know what you do best. Uh, but it's hard to kind of be on the outside. Uh, you still have a lot of responsibility, but you're not going to hit one single golf shot. So uh, I just think uh, my biggest job is to facilitate uh, the entire team that's also surrounding the players. Uh, to kind of bring that atmosphere up to, to a different level. So kind of, so that's already set uh, in uh, for the most part. So it's more details, I think, um, how we can make this the most memorable life uh, week of a player's uh, career so far. Yeah, definitely. And like you touched on it, and I always hear different things, but like the role of a captain, because we just see it, you pick the team, you know, you're there on tournament weekend, you possibly set up the course to your advantage, but like, what other roles are there actually for being a captain? Because I've heard all sorts. You're, you're, you're maybe you're picking uniforms or like all those sort of little things. You know what I mean? So, so what is the role? What have you been doing? When you have to look from anything from apparel to apparel uh, on and off the golf course. I um, mean, there's a lot of different yeah. occasions you have to deal with. Uh, 
you have uh, menus, uh, what's going to be served each and every day for breakfast, lunch and dinner, uh, uh, room uh, allocations, uh, gifts, uh, support team. Uh, wow. uh, I mean, you, I mean, you name it. I try to leave uh, most of the big uh, responsibilities for the LET staff. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, small decisions that needs to be made, uh, I need to be part of. Um, so uh, it's going to be fun. I really look forward yeah. to it. Yeah, but obviously one big decision you did have was the vice captains. And we've got Laura, Laura Caroline and uh, Anna. How did you go about picking those and what was the process like? I mean, Laura wasn't obvious. Uh, she's been uh, a part of uh, the captaincy team over the last, especially with Beanie. Uh, obviously, she's an icon in the game, and she's uh, she's the queen of Solheim. Um, I know she's not has a big desire to be a captain, but I know she really loves to be involved, and um, she was a very obvious choice for me. Uh, so she was happy to be part of it. Um, Anna, um, obviously now the most. So I would say almost the most experienced uh, player uh, kind of still playing um, and I see her as a potential captain down the road. Uh, so that kind of will bring her kind of the inside scoop a little bit more. So she kind of knows how that is uh, like, uh, even though I really hope she will play. Uh, so that's kind of uh, that is our plan that she'll be a vice captain, but playing. Uh, and she is great uh, taking on uh, the young ones on the team. Uh, she really showed a lot of character last year in Toledo, I thought. Um, really finding a great form uh, coming into the solo. I'm obviously winning the British Open uh, uh, a couple of weeks prior, but that was kind of what boosted her. And it just really translated um, to a lot of the other girls. Uh, so I think she did great. And Caroline, she has her kind of time from the LET. She has a lot of experience from playing professionally. She knows literally L.E.T. Uh, inside out uh, and she is a phenomenal uh, with people and uh, team building and I think that's an important aspect as well. So uh, between Anna, Laura and myself, if you have enough Solheim experience to kind of know how we're going to set up the team and uh, I'd like to bring in the players as well. I'd like to have the players involved with kind of decisions uh, throughout the week. I think it's important that players uh, feel like they're part of decisions made. Uh, they will have a say. Uh, I think it's important. So communication is obviously going to be key. Uh, and Caroline is phenomenal doing that. So she's already been very helpful for me. She's obviously one of my best uh, best uh, friends. So we talk a lot. Uh, but lately, it's also been a lot of Solheim talk. So um, it's fun to kind of share that as well uh, with her. And in terms of your schedule for kind of the year, um, are you planning to attend some events, for example, in the summer, the majors, and get to see the players that meet them across the LET, but also the LPGA as well? Yeah, I'll see. I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I have uh, quite a few events lined up. Uh, I must say, I mean, all the players, uh, thankfully, I know most of the players quite well. So a lot of them I kind of stay in touch with. Uh, uh, um, I try to kind of at least connect with them uh, over social media or more of a personal phone um, uh, from time to time. Uh, and I think like it's most important to kind of get to know the new players uh, better so they kind of feel comfortable coming into a big week like this. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to be at the, some LET events. Uh, I'm going to go to some of the LPGA ones. But for me, I'm not going to go scout players while they play. I think it's, lit. I don't know how much I can take from it. If I see a player make two parts and a birdie and a bogey, it's, like, it's more the personalities I'm looking for, not necessarily their golfing skills, because I know them uh, from... Uh, you almost see more from watching TV, but it's more of a showing face, being present, being available, being approachable. Um, it's more to that aspect that uh, being uh, out of the tournaments is important. Um, we spoke earlier about your comeback for 19. Um, and you said you quite enjoyed that process of having that goal to come back and be able to play. Talk me through a little bit about what you actually did once you'd had your son and you know 
how did you get back well first of all i mean after i had uh herman i had no big desire to rush back to golf um so i kind of it, it took me a while before i actually got my clubs in my hand and I, maybe i waited too long but once i kind of uh gave it a green light uh we reorganized the, the logistics and um we still lived in the U.S. at the time, so we kind of moved over to Orlando. I spent uh, a lot of uh, weeks practicing, preparing. I was even in Spain, where we also have a place. Kind of, I kind of made sure I kind of had enough reps because it was kind of. It's not like you, you you're not trying to uh, you know how to play. You just have to kind of get the reps in. Um, and I mean, it was weird. But in the beginning, it felt like. I had a baseball bat in my hand for quite a while and then it kind of translated more into getting more familiar and then I remember I was on the range in Orlando just uh, weeks before the Dow um, team event um, where I'm standing on the range and all of a sudden I started to flush flush it and there was nobody there to see it and I remember I flushed a few I'm like God, I still got it I kind of looked around to kind of did you see that there was nobody to see it I'm like wow what a waste um, but you kind of you go through emotions, uh, but I think that is the fun part of um, that's kind of what I enjoy the most. That kind of the process, um, kind of leading up to being ready and being prepared uh, going into tournaments, and then obviously played the team event with Beanie. And I mean, I don't know if I feel like I played great, but I felt like I had control of uh, kind of uh, the development of where it was going and or where. Or, where my form was heading um, and that was a little bit based as well on experience I knew where my game had to be uh, it's not like I was guessing so that kind of made it easier so that's kind of where years of experience kind of helps and then when I played with the beanie we always we were paired with Anna and uh, Headwall and I guess they were like wow uh, and I uh, well I've been retold that they had talked between the three of them like she's capable of making it to Solheim so we should push her so then I remember Beanie came up to me like can you please just play a few more events <laughs> because it would kind of look silly if you haven't played more than one event in like two years and I pick you I said I'm not going to play anymore Beanie I was just going to play this event and no more she goes well but you're going to be on the team I'm like no I'm not so it was like we're still negotiating but in the fun part uh earlier that year in 19 I mean we had these uh phone calls between the vice captains and Beanie and we kept kind of going, running to the team who were kind of in at the time, who would kind of be potential picks. And there was always this joke from Laura. And then uh, we had like uh, number one, two, three picks, and number four picks is uh, Patterson. I'm like, Laura, stop it. I haven't even started touching a club. But then it ended up being quite real. And um, yeah, uh, it was quite a painful uh, comeback kind of uh, from a competitive side. Um, I definitely felt rusty in a couple of uh, events leading up to it. But once I got to Glen Eagles the week off, it felt like I'd never been away. And it felt like the most natural thing for me, natural thing to be part of it. So, uh, yeah, it all kind of adds up. Uh, and like, I don't have to do it again. And obviously, Herman was there with you that week. Um, what's it like having a child around you when obviously you're also part of the team? How did you manage that respect that week? I think I have to give my credit to a very helpful husband. Uh, I mean, that, that I think uh, is a very credit to all moms out there. I mean, um, I don't know how they juggle all the, the time. I mean, you don't really have the same time as you had before you had kids. So before you had kids, you had the entire world. Uh, I mean, I mean, you, you were totally in control of uh, 24 hours a day. And uh, obviously now it's different, but at the same time, I think you get more efficient uh, with the time when you're finally practicing or playing. Um, and it kind of puts all in perspective uh, what's important in life. And uh, for me, golf, uh, I mean, it still is massively important, and especially when you still compete. I mean, it is important and you, you really try to do your best. But at the end of the day, a smile from him coming back to the hotel room kind of could make up for maybe a tough day on the golf course or whatever. So uh, it worked out and uh, he was uh, still very young. Unfortunately, he probably doesn't remember any of it. He can see pictures. Uh, but uh, for me, it was more of a barrier to kind of prove to myself that I could come back. Uh, 
after having given birth. And uh, if I hadn't done it, I think I would have questioned it for the rest of my life. Would I have been able to get back to like the top, to top of the game, to kind of be able to compete with the best in the world? And I'm very glad that I did because I proved to myself that I could. And that was maybe the biggest relief uh, when that final putt kind of dropped. And I kind of, it was more like a clap on my own shoulder, like, yes, you did it. Um, more than actually getting the winning point. Um, so, um, yeah, you just kind of go through a lot of uh, kind of different processes that kind of all ends, leads to the same goal. But um, there were a lot of thoughts. Uh, that was spent uh, around this if I should have done it. I remember two weeks out before the 2019 uh, Solheim, I remember we were having a Sunday dinner at my parents and my dad was like, why are you on the team? And I'm like, who are you to question that? Like, at least, uh, well, I, obviously we like that got the captain speak from you, dad, but uh, can we have this discussion, like, can we please have this discussion kind of after the Solheim? And I remember as we landed in Oslo after the Solheim, we all flew back together. And I remember walking out to the car and I said to dad, uh, I, th I think it was a pretty good decision as well uh, to pl go play. And he's like, yeah, I think you were right there. <laughs> so it was kind of a uh, heart to heart kind of conversation with my dad. But uh, I think it's important um, to kind of go through that. And uh, But it was more of a proof to myself, I think, um, thing. And obviously you then had your daughter couple of years later as well um how has mother motherhood been treating you what's it like with two of them running around i've never been more sick uh, so um uh it's a crazy household uh, at the, these days uh, obviously uh herman's getting bigger now he he'll be five in august so he's starting to become a small little man and uh, he's fun to be around and um, he does all kinds of activities while his sister is, um, uh, believe it or not, uh, a true copy of me. So watch out, world. Uh, she's very stubborn. Uh, she's going to give him a hard time. And she's already, she already is. Um, but uh, it's fun. It's crazy. But at the same time, um, um, I couldn't see a life without kids, uh, even though I miss golf. But uh, there's a time for everything. And obviously they've come out to a couple of tournaments last year. Um, your daughter loves going on a golf cart. <laughs> um, what's it like when you do travel with them? Obviously you've got your husband there, occasionally other family members. How integral is that support system as you've mentioned? Well, I, thought, I mean, we, we've come to this conclusion, Christian, now, that uh, we want to do everything as a family. Um, and um, I think it's nice to kind of get the kids uh, uh adjusted to traveling and kind of uh seeing different parts of the world i know they're still young but uh, it's nice to kind of have have them as frequent flyers uh kind of getting familiar to kind of uh, a lifestyle that we kind of uh, see ourselves in the future as well so um i think uh, like like i said i mean if i am going to travel a lot i would love to bring them kind of um to spend the journey with me uh uh, because that's important for us. So uh, otherwise I wouldn't have done it if I had to kind of do everything on my own and leave everyone behind me every single time. Uh, I don't think I would have enjoyed it as much. So for me to be able to share it with the Christian, obviously, but also my kids, um, Herman obviously now understands more. Uh, he gets it. Um, uh, that is fun for me. Um, so uh, that was one of the hard parts when I was going making the comeback, the few events that I had to go away and play. I mean, I mean, it was great to go play, but it didn't make sense when I got back to the hotel room and I knowing like, like my son and my husband was kind of on the other side of the world. It, it kind of didn't make sense. I remember I called Chris was like, if I'm going to do it, we'll have to do it together. Um, so um, that's it's just become a part of the package, I guess, for us. Uh, and we love it. Uh, we also love uh, being uh, a couple of days away from the kids. Uh, believe me or not, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, I find it fun to kind of share this as a journey together. Yeah, definitely. Now, Suzanne, we are going to end this on a quiz. Um, so you've got some questions for you. We're going to test you about your career. Um, now, they start off easy and they get a little bit harder. Um, so we're going to test your knowledge and see how you do just to end the podcast. All right. So you ready? Fire. Okay, let's see how you get on. So question one, 
The year's 2001 that opened the France. You win your first LET event. Who did you beat in the playoff? Thank you, Morgan. There we go. I said they started off easy. Didn't even flinch. Okay. 36 Solheim Cups you've played in your career. How many have you won? And what is your overall record? We've won... Uh, four? Four, four and, winning tickets, I think. Yeah, what's your record? 21... I don't know, 21, 5... Somewhere in there. No, so it's 18, 12, 6. Yeah, there you go. Almost. Okay, question three. So... Solheim Cup again. The year's 2002, and you play your first ever match where you win a point uh, with Helen Alfredson. Who were your opponents? Well, I had no idea. I mean, I had more so, than that. just get myself around that course. <laughs> that's true. So you beat Pat Hurst and Kelly Robbins, four and two. Moving on to your career again, what was the lowest score that you ever shot on the LET? On the LET? Hmm. 62, maybe? Yes. Can you remember the tournament? It's slow. Uh, HP Open 2003. Oh no, it was in Barsberg. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Mm. That was in uh, Switzerland where there was a tournament where I won by a lot as well. Yeah, we'll give you half the point. You got the year uh, and you got the score. Okay, in your career, how many top 10 finishes have you had in majors? A lot. <laughs> Good answer. It is a lot, yeah. It's. Do you want to have a guess? In majors, I'm not sure, but I know on the LPGA, I have over 100 and whatever top 10s. Uh, so, in majors, I, I can't give you a number. Yeah, it's 23 in majors, but that's quite the flex with the LPGA <laughs> top 10s. Incredible. Yeah, okay. This one should be actually quite easy, but I'll, I'm asking for number one and number two. So who are your most successful Solheim Cup partners in four pool and foursomes combined? Annika and Sophie, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Easy as that. And final question. At what event did you have your biggest margin of victory? In uh, 2009, was it Switzerland, I think? No, you're, you're close with the year. I have no idea. So it was the 2007 uh, SAS Masters in Sweden. What was the margin? Um, it was nine shots. Wow, didn't know that. It was that easy, you forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> that was years ago. Yeah, but no, you, you, there were some tough ones in there. So uh, yeah, solid effort, really good. I told George that you did like a quiz, so we thought we'd upgrade the questions slightly. I was worried. I was like, I'm, I'm doing a quiz with Suzanne Petson. She's going she's, she's gonna to grill me and do good the questions, but <laughs> that was good fun. Yeah, you're a good sport. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but yeah, once again, congratulations, Suzanne. And thanks for coming on the LET Golf Podcast. It's been great to have you. Thanks and have a great season, all of you. And I'll see you in Spain in September. Yes, thank you. See you guys. So there we go. Suzanne Pedersen raring to go after it was announced earlier today that the Solheim Cup legend will be captain of the European team once again in 2024. But before that, there's still plenty of golf to be played on the LET this season. Up next, we head to South Africa for a doubleheader, beginning with the Joburg Open at Modafontein Golf Club. As always, we'll be there to cover all the action, and we'll also have a couple of South African stars swinging by to join the pod. You don't want to miss it. Until then, we hope you enjoyed episode three of the LET Golf Podcast. If you did, please leave us a review on Spotify, Apple, or whichever platform you're streaming from. And remember to follow us on the socials at LET Golf. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. It's a competition clinching shot. The LET Golf Podcast, the official podcast of the Ladies European Tour.